Thanks for being here, everybody, in the last uh, session of the last day, or the last few remaining survivors, which is pretty exciting. Um, as Carl mentioned, I'm a trainer for Maxon. Like, that's my official job duty. And so one of the things that we do is that, like, if somebody buys a bunch, like, if we have a customer that, like, buys a bunch of licenses or whatever, we just, we give them, like, free training like crazy. So that's, like, one of the things that I do is, like, I, you will have, like, these Zoom meetings or whatever with, you know, customers and uh, teach them how to use our stuff. So uh, one of the things I teach about is uh, particular. And uh, a lot of times when I'm teaching particular, there'll be somebody in the group that I'm teaching who's just like, I've been using particular forever. I'm super advanced. I know everything. And 100% of the time, when somebody says that, their artwork is amazing, and it's better than everything that they make is better than anything I will ever make. But also, almost 100% of the time, there is a bunch of stuff that they don't know. There's a bunch of things that they like, oh, I wasn't aware that that existed. And so in my years of teaching clients, I've decided to make like a little like composite of uh, these little like hidden gems that a lot of people don't seem to be aware of, the things that you can do in particular. And sometimes they're, you know, they're new features and so people aren't aware that, aware that they exist or maybe like it's, uh, they don't understand what it's doing or where it is or uh, whatever. But these are the 10 hidden gems of a uh, trap code particular. So the first hidden gem is emit from parent end of life. Emit from pa parent end of life. So let's talk about what that is about. By show of hands, uh, if anybody's brave enough to raise their hand here. This is the last, this is the last session, nobody's here. Um, does anybody know what this is off the top of their heads? Anybody like show of hands? I mean, it's like, I know what, yeah, the head of training knows what this is uh, for Maxon. But uh, okay, no other hands, okay. So let's talk about what, what this is about. This is a fun one that uh, sounds really morbid and dark, uh, but it's actually very, very useful. So we're gonna start with a very ugly example. So don't just get up and walk away because this looks terrible. This is intentionally, looks really bad, so it's very clear what's going on. So I have here these, again, uh, little particles that are just like shooting off. Now for a long time in particular, we've been able to add uh, auxiliary particles and that creates that makes it so that one particle can emit other particles now we changed that a few years ago so instead of having auxiliary particles we have multiple systems so that's in this like the show systems area all these different systems and we can reference a parent system so we can have like child particle systems that emit from a parent emitter so uh, if I go to my second system, which I've already set up here, open this up, and I can change this from emitter type from point, where it's just kind of like emitting from a point in the center. I could change this to emit from parent. So now, each one of these parent particles, each one of these uh, ugly pink stars becomes an emitter. And that's really important. So that's, a, that's the first step is that, uh, that's the new auxiliary particles is emit from parent. But when we go to the uh, emitter from parent behavior, we have all of these very interesting options. Uh, and some of these we'll be looking at like as we go throughout my little uh, presentation here. But one of them is emit at parent end of life. So if I choose this option now, I don't have a very long lifespan on these uh, pink stars, <clears throat> but you'll see there's no white particles. But as soon as a pink particle dies, then we have the new system emitting at the parent end of life. That's very intriguing. What can you do with that? I'm glad no one asked. I'm glad you asked. You're thinking it in your head. So uh, one of the things that I did, um, which is really awesome, I, I love the, the 1950s. I love that kind of like atomic age, mid-century modern, like uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle, like art style. It's like dopey and fun and like homemade. And I don't know, it's just reminds me of being a, a child. And so I convinced Maxon to let me add some assets to the asset browser. And so I, I made these two different uh, assets. I made uh, a series of bubbles. So it's just like a distorted circle every frame. And make, that makes bubbles. And then I made this second uh, sprite, which is like, <laughs> this is like an illustrator, super low uh, budget here, but just like these little lines that kind of like go out like that. So it's just like a little pop, you know, just like a little pop. So I wanted to make some fun carbonation. So what I did is I had on one system, I have my, my bubbles and they don't last very long. So my little bubbles go up, my little 1950s fun bubbles. Isn't that fun? I think it's fun. I think it's so cute. Look at it. Woo. 
Ooh, bubbles. Uh, and then I have my second system emit from the parent end of life. So then when the bubble pops or dies, then my little like, woo, 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 little like, um, my little animation, my little pop happens. And then we put it together. It's a little pop, 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 pop. Little fun, happy, fun, little pop thing. Because we're using this feature, the emit from parent end of life. So the little pop is triggered when the parent particle dies. And this is a new preset we just added to the asset, or the, um, not the asset browser, the uh, designer. Uh, in particular, so you can use this uh, whenever you'd like. Uh, there's another uh, preference or another uh, preset that I created that was just um, released, which, which is a bullet hit. So we have one system that's going into a wall, and actually it's a bounce system, which we're going to talk about in a second, a little spoiler for, for uh, hidden gem number two. Uh, but it's hitting a wall and exploding, and then it's uh, have the little sparks that uh, they hit. So these little sparks are emitted at the end of the parent life again. And then I did this other final one, uh, good for splashes. So a little fire hydrant, and there's some like cartoony water that comes out, and then there's like some cartoony uh, splashes. So all kinds of things where you need kind of like an impact or something that reacts, uh, emit from parent end of life. Great hidden gem. Okay, let's move on to hidden gem. Number, nope, I hit the wrong shortcut key. I was very anticlimactic. Uh, number two is built-in ground plane. So for a long time, particles have been able to bounce. Um, but the bouncing, the way that they bounce has been, how do I put this delicately? It's been annoying. It's been really, really annoying and frustrating to work with a lot of times because that's to use the 3D and After Effects and blah, blah, blah. It's kind of a mess. But now there's a built-in ground plane in, uh, in particular. So if I have particles, I just have these particles set up, it's just dumb particles. They're just like falling down to the ground, right? I can go into physics simulations, enable bounce. And normally this would take an external layer to do this, but I can choose enable ground plane. And now there's this ground plane area, I'll open up ground plane and I could see it by choosing show overlay so I could see where it is. So now I don't need to get another layer and position it in like 3D space, wherever that is and then try to like guess where it's gonna land. I could just use this ground plane, and look at that, beautiful little bounce. And I could adjust the height of this, I could have it go, uh, oops, probably not 103%. But I could have it go uh, higher, lower, I can tilt it, roll it, uh, that kind of thing to create all kinds of interesting effects. Now, one of the great things about bounce, if you've never used bounce, is that uh, there is this collision event. So not only do you get to say like, hey, look, I could bounce particles, which is fun, but you could also specify what happens at the bounce. Now, the default is just like the standard bounce, and you bounce. But there's also a slide. So we could hit the thing, and instead of bouncing, it's just like slide. And then we also have the particles like stick onto the things. Or, which is very interesting in light of hidden gem number one, we could have the particles kill. So we could have the particles touch the bounce, this new built in ground plane from hidden gem number two, and they touch the ground plane, and then we could kill them which can then trigger the emit from parent end of life that we just learned about in the hidden gem number one. So it all works together. Sharing a Coke for the benefit of mankind. Peace, I don't know. Okay, hidden gem number three. Doo -doo -doo. I need the Zelda music. You know, like in Zelda when you used a bomb on a cave and it's like, -doo 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 -doo. Uh, I wish I had that. I was actually thinking about it enough time. I ran out of time. Okay, stroke from parent. Stroke from Parent is the third hidden gem. Uh, and this was just released like a couple days ago. I don't know what day it is or where I am, but it was released just a few days ago. It's brand new, Stroke from Parent. And this is really great because <clears throat> there's a lot of times where you can kind of like hack particular to do certain things. Um, and in this case, um, I, have, I wanna create these like streams of particles. So then you have to use a bunch of particles, bunch, 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 bunch of particles to create the illusion that there's like a straight line. Really just want a straight line though. But then if those straight lines bend too much, like we have here, then we stretch and we see that it's actually just a series of particles and that's kind of like annoying. So it kind of kills my design because I have to keep increasing the number of particles. Well, not anymore, my friends, thanks to hidden gem number three, I can go to stroke from parent. And so on my child system, Basically, this, the way this is made, if you're new to particular, 
is I have these just random particles just kind of like shooting out with my parent system. And then I have a second system that says emit from parent. And the second system doesn't have any of its own velocity. It's just kind of like, I'll go where you want me to go. And then um, there's a bunch of them, so it creates these trails. But again, we have that, that issue before. But now this new feature um, in the emitter type, instead of emitting from parent, we can choose to create a stroke from parent. So I'm going to zoom in so you can see this a little bit more clearly. See all that uh, garbage and that nonsense going on nobody has time for? I change this to stroke from parent. Boom, look at that. Clean lines, smooth, beautiful, clean, stroked from parents' lines. And now we have these great electrical magic things here. Now, this uh, project also is spoiling hidden gem number four, because hidden gem number four, uh, this is using a bunch of stuff from hidden gem number four. So let's talk about that. We're going to come back here in a second. So hidden gem number four, feel free to play the Zelda music in your head. Hidden gem number four is child inheritance. Now, I have to admit that this was uh, an interesting thing. When the uh, product manager of Trap Code told me that they're coming out with this feature, I was like, bro, I think you're, I think you're missing the mark on that one. That's, we already have like, the ability to inherit stuff from parent systems. It's no big deal. But then he schooled me, and it's actually an epic, incredible feature for using multiple systems together in intelligent ways. So this is um, before child inheritance. So like earlier this year, this is the best you could do um, with uh, particular with creating that kind of like look I was going for before. Because what would happen is, if I open up the designer, I have my uh, design. And what you could do before, so I have my parent system that's using like this color and it has like, it's hard to see. This is not a good trainer thing of me to do because I I knew this projector was like this, that it would be impossible to see. But uh, I have these like little circles here. Maybe I could increase the size so you could see them. See those? See those little circles? Uh, so I have these little circles, and those are the parent particles. And then I have the, uh, the, the stroke from parent that are the, the children particles. Now what I could do is I can delete the size rotation block in the designer so that the child uses the size rotation of the parent and it uses the opacity or whatever. But here's where that is a problem. If I have, for example, random size, so if I click on the size rotation block of the parent system, I have a size random of 100%. So those little like colored circles are all random sizes. Also, I have opacity random at 100%. They're all random opacities. So when I delete the child opacity block, it's using 100% opacity too. It's using that from the parent, but it's not the same Opacity, does that make sense? So if like there's a parent particle that it's 37% opacity, the child particle is not 37% opacity, it's just some other random number. But with child inheritance, it does have the 37% opacity. It matches the parent, so you can create a much more interesting and beautiful effects. So that's what we have here. Inherit opacity from parent. So when we uh, check this, and actually I'll just go ahead and cancel in the designer, and you can see it a little bit more clearly because it's laid out here. I can inherit the particle type from the parent system. I can inherit the size from parent. I can inherit the opacity from parent. And also, there's a color from parent uh, slider here. I can increase this to 100%. So now, instead of just like using the same gradient and getting whatever random colors, it can actually use the exact uh, color of the, that exact parent particle and the exact opacity of that parent particle, the exact size of that parent particle. And that allows us to have something unique like this where the head particle is the same opacity as the tail particle. It's the same color, the same size, same everything else. Uh, for more advanced users, you might say, well, what if I still want a little bit of control over my child particles, that's where you could still come in and use the size over life graphs. So I can come over here to my presets, use a linear slope, and then this is still trailing so that the start of the particle is still using the size from the parent, and then we have control over the rest of the tail by using these uh, graphs, which is pretty fun. Okay, moving right along. Okay, this is a, this is a fun one. This is a fun one. This is like a... This is probably the highlight of the presentation right here. This is probably the best stuff. So the number five is the power of custom sprites. So we know that particle systems are just a series of like particles. We call them sprites. And then they're shooting off, doing 
business. They're doing their own thing. Um, and they could be little spheres. They could be whatever we want. And there's a bunch of built-in ones. There's like all these different shapes. There's stars and things like that. And there's a tendency to feel like, you know, and also there's a good, this great library I should point out too. Like there's, you know, if I go to, oh, let me, uh, okay, particle type. I could choose Sprite and then I click choose Sprite and there's a big library of a bunch of shapes that we could choose from. They're just built into particular. And there's a tendency, I think, but even between like more advanced intermediate uh, particular users to be like, this is just all there is. This is just kind of like the choices that you have in sprites is like the ones that are built in. No, this is just an extra library. You can actually use almost anything as a custom sprite and you could get in all kinds of wonderful, wonderful trouble by playing around with what you can use as sprites. So I mentioned my little like, uh, you know, carbonation thing, my little uh, carbonation uh, animation. What's really interesting about this, though, that maybe is not super obvious, is that my bubbles composition that I'm using, these are both actually movie files. So you can use any images in your composition as sprites, as particles. You could use movie files. You can use comps. You could use anything, Illustrator files, anything you bring into uh, After Effects, basically, you can use as a particle in particular. And not only that, I should have split this into two. I could have really milked it and saved myself some more if I was to split this into two tricks. But a big part of that, too, is not only uh, the fact that you can have anything be a particle, but it's the way that you can use those particles. So I mentioned like my little bubbles here, right? And I just basically, like the way that I, I made this little movie is I made a circle shape layer and then distorted it with like turbulent displace. Um, but then, you know, the, the movie itself is like garbage. And I don't really actually want these bubbles to do this. I just wanted a bunch of variations. But then when I set this up as a custom particle, in particular, and we can go there really quick, go to the bubbles, I'm go to my, my particle section, go to my sprites. I have all these sprite controls. In these sprite controls, I have this time sampling. And this is where the power of this tip really comes in handy, is in this thing. The way that we can control how particular samples, the video animation thing, is, gives us so much flexibility. So I have it set to random still frame. So basically what that does is it looks at my like, wobbly bubbles, and it doesn't use any of the animation at all. It just takes a random frame from anywhere in that movie, and then every particle is just one of those random frames. So then I have all this variation in my bubbles without doing anything else. But wait, there's more. Um, I have an uh, auto save. Oh, killed my thunder so much. Killed my thunder so much. Anyways, okay. So I have this um, pre-comp using HUD components. And uh, not to bore you with the technical specs, but this actually is, this is relevant. But it's a six seconds long pre-comp that I'm using as the particle. And there's three different animations, all from HUD components in Universe. So three different animations in the same pre-comp. Because if I wanted to use, like I have this like, array of particles, right? And let's say that I wanted each one to be a different animating particle. That's a pretty tough challenge. If those of you that are familiar with particular, think about that for a second. If you had to have like a grid of particles in form and each one had to be a different movie file playing back, a different animation, like how would you set that up? Like you might have to do like multiple systems and then it, it, it would be a, a logistical nightmare if you don't know about this feature called split clip. So I have this set up by the default settings, but, uh, and this renders really slow because it's like a, there's like a lot going on. There's the HUD components, like animation in the background. But if I keep playing this for a second, let's see here. I'm just gonna skip ahead. Cause this is the, this is the default settings. So you notice that some of these change over. I'm trying to find one that changes over. Okay, here we go. So um, this green one, second from the left, second from the bottom, you know, it plays uh, a, a random spot and then it changes over to the red one. Well, I don't want that. I want each particle to stay with the blue, stay with the green, stay with the red. So how can I do that? What I can do is I can go into my sprite settings and the time sampling, there's this amazing thing called split clip. And the brilliance of this is that it looks inside the file 
and it allows you to use chunks of a video file or chunks of a pre-comp and split it up evenly and use separate portions of that as a video particle. So I'll say split clip loop. And once I do that, um, then what it's going to do, oh, that shouldn't happen. Oh, yeah, once you do that, then you have to specify the, boy, this like, thing is uh, impossible to see, the number of clips. I have to specify the number of clips, and then it will divide the comp or the video into equal portions. And I didn't do that yet. So I need to say that there's three equal portions here. That should change things. And now the particles just stay. The red particles are just like, well, there's some weird frames in there from, uh, no. Yeah, like right here, there's a little glitch. I'd have to clear out my cache, my memory cache. But the thing is that these things um, loop and they just use that one little section, and they just loop the same frame. So you're able to have multiple video particles that just loop in this, using the same system, which is uh, very powerful. Um, let's see. Oh, here's another uh, use of, how are we doing on time? We're we doing OK on time. This project takes a second to load, because this is like really beefy. We'll look at a rendered version of this in a bit. But I decided um, that. Uh, my life is too enjoyable and I'd like to torture myself. So I decided to recreate uh, Van Gogh's Starry Night entirely in tra uh, trap code particular. I call it particularly Starry Night um, because uh, I'm not original and I just, <laughs> just thought of the first thing that came to mind. But the process of doing that was one of my favorite learning experiences using particular. I learned so much about um, little nuances and this is one of the things that kind of really stuck out to me. Uh, again, I'll play you the rendered version in just, a, in just a bit. But I wanted to show you one aspect of the working project, which is obviously, you know, it's colossal. Also, I set this up to be too big. I don't remember what the size was, but it's, it's colossal, and it's, it was dumb. But if you look at this, there's like these animated paint strokes. Um, actually, you know what? I, I'm going to have to show you the rendered version, or else this isn't going to make any sense. OK, so let me play the rendered version here. So that's, that's the, uh, the final rendered version of like Starry Night there. But if you look at like, you know, some of these like paint things, it feels like little like, uh, you know, like pieces of, uh, pieces of paint here. And a lot of this is, um, or like a, these like paint strokes created in like the easiest possible way, which is really interesting. So I, let's go to my paint from capsule. So if I look at this, these are my paint strokes. These are so low budget, it's uh, ridiculous. If I take off the effects, I'm just using the capsule. I actually stole this from the particular sprite library, just a plain capsule. And then I uh, added these effects on it. I added like uh, rough and edges, and then I put turbulent displace on them, and then turbulent noise, which looks terrible. And then I tend to just change it a little bit. So then all of these different particles are just random shapes. And so I use the power of the sprite stuff I was telling you about, the, the time sampling thing, to be able to tell you know, each paint stroke should be using a different one of these like janky things. And then I just like recolored it, and I was able to come up with something that like doesn't feel that janky to me. So there's that. That's fun. OK. Moving on to hidden gem number six, which is, oops. <laughs> <laughs> Killed my own thunder on that one. I maximized the time limit. Okay, one more time. It is number six. Two kinds of wind, two kinds of turbulence. Two kinds of wind, two kinds of turbulence. This one is, uh, this is just as dumb as it sounds, actually. I'm going to be honest with you. This is not, uh, this one's not that thrilling. It's kind of like a more of a technical thing. This is kind of like the weak part of the, this is the weak one of the bunch. But it's still helpful to know about, I think. So um, inside of particular, there's always been like turbulence for the longest time. You could add turbulence to particles and make them kind of like move around in an organic way. And there's also been like wind for a long time. And then what a lot of people don't know is that a couple years ago, we changed that and we added a new system, but also kept the old system. So now there's two different ways to displace particles and two different ways to add wind to particles. And people are confused um, oftentimes about them. And so I want to 
lay it down here. So this uh, in the displaced category, actually, let me go to particular so we could like look at this. In the displaced category, there is this um, turbulent field area. Turbulence field, you see in that there? Turbulence field. So this is this, the old system that's been there. And if I play this, this is what that happens. It's, it's great for like particles moving over a surface, getting displaced, riding waves, uh, that kind of thing. But you know, if you're thinking about the way that uh, life works most of the time, you know, like in air, when a particle like hits something that causes it to move a different direction and change its physics, like it doesn't go back to where it started. It just keeps going in that trajectory. It doesn't like return. But if you look at this uh, displaced turbulent field, things, particles get bumped and then they come back down. They get bumped and they come back down. And that's, that's not realistic. So then we also have this environment air turbulence, which is a more advanced simulation. Um, and it takes a little bit longer to render, not, not much, but a little bit longer to render because it's actually doing a real simulation of what it would feel like to hit air turbulence. So you can really see the difference here. If I play this. So the top one again is the old displace turbulent field where it's just kind of like going up and down. And the second one is much more realistic. It's, it's gonna start uh, messing up my design here and <laughs> encroaching upon uh, the other thing because as those particles, again, in a very realistic and organic way, they hit the air turbulence, they keep going in that direction. So uh, much more realistic. Let's see the difference there. Very interesting. So be aware of that. Um, and then also there's two different kinds of uh, wind. So in this example, I'm using something called meander, which is um, uh, an effect for a, a, a physics simulation effect, which causes each particle to kind of have their own like state of mind. So it kind of looks like an aerial view of like people just being like confused and like wandering around. Um, and so there's two different kinds of wind. So the, the original wind is now in the displaced section Oops, come on, there we go. So the original uh, wind is in the displaced system as well. So all the old stuff is in the, uh, the uh, displaced area. And so this is drift, which is what used to be called wind is now called drift. And it's a little bit less intelligent. So this is what we've always had. It works with physics simulations, just kind of moves it along, just get, etches it along there, that's fine. but. The new system, which is actually called wind, and it's the new wind, is a little bit more intelligent. It's going to look at the particles, and you could just tell by the way the particles move that it's a much more organic, uh, intelligent system of moving. So again, the top is the old system in the drift and displaced category, and the bottom one is uh, in the environment section where all the new fancy stu physics stuff is, is wind. And notice how the stuff on the bottom, like, you could see the turbulence in the air that it's not moving all particles uniformly in the same way. The top stuff feels a little bit like uh, less organic. It's just like kind of scooting. It's almost like you animated the position property of it or something like that. You're just kind of scoot it along. Whereas the bottom one feels like it's being influenced by a force. And indeed it is. So, okay, moving on from that tip. Hinge jab number seven. Okay, I'm gonna maximize this. Hidden gem number seven. It is form in particular equals love. Uh, anybody use trap code form? Anybody use trap code form? Yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. Form is like my favorite, favorite thing. I love form so much. Um, and uh, people have wondered like why we don't talk about trap code form that much. And it's because we actually put trap code form inside of particular. So a lot of people who are fans of track code form are not aware that we put form into form behavior into particular. And basically what track code form is, if you're not um, familiar with it, is that you know, most particle systems, including particular, have this uh, way of doing things where you, know, you, have, you have an emitter that shoots out particles and the particles have a lifespan and then they live and then they die out. That's just kind of like particle system 101. This is what they do. But form, doesn't have a birth or a death. The particles are just there, like immortal gods. They just exist. And then you could do all kinds of wacky stuff to them because they're just there. I think it, like for motion designers, for VFX, for 
all kinds of things. Like Form is so versatile. It's just like one of the most like underused, amazing tools. And they have it now built in. The way you use this is I go into the emitter section and I need to choose either box or sphere. And so I could choose box and then I need to change the behavior. Cause even if you say box, it's like still like emitting from a box. But now I need to change the behavior, the emitter behavior from just continuously emitting to either classic or dynamic form. The difference between these two, by the way, is that uh, dynamic form is used for physics simulations. But if you're not using physics simulations, then you want to make sure and choose classic form in all other cases. So I choose classic form. And now as I play this back, you'll see no difference. The particles just exist. And I can go to distribution. I could put these on a grid. And there I have a grid of particles. I could specify how many particles I want in X, Y, or Z. I could specify the size with the emitter size. Now I just have this box of particles. And I could do all these kind of beautiful formy things. Like I could go to my particle settings, change the color to something uh, more pleasing to the eye here. And then I can go into uh, displace, uh, turbulence field, affect uh, the displacement of these particles and start creating some like really interesting results here. And maybe I could go even go to uh, a blend mode, add the add blend mode. So when these particles overlap, they get brighter and uh, you know, we can do all kinds of interesting things uh, with these particles. Now um, I can also go to the designer. This is another thing that people don't, uh, aren't aware of. For those of us that are fans of particular, maybe I could just reset this. Yeah, okay, start from scratch. What I can do is I can go to the emitter type and instead of going and choosing all those settings one by one and being like, oh, I gotta change this to this and change this to this, I can just go into my blocks here. You just put your mouse over that blocks in the upper right-hand corner. And there's all these blocks right there. C form box right there. Classic form box, that's what the C stands for. And there's a dynamic form box or a classic form box or a classic form sphere or whatever. And I could just choose classic form box and I already have form just ready to go from a, a, a block just ready to go there. Now. Um, just to show you, this is an example that I, when, when we first announced this feature, I uh, played with this, I was like, what can you do? So I did this with just one, one instance of particular. This was on like 16 different systems, but this is what happens when you use particular and form together. It's just like all kinds of different things, aspects of this, or some are form, some are particular, but it's all just one layer, one instance of particular on one layer, but all these layers like working together. And look at how like the smoke from particular is uh, going around the you know, stripe of the star in form. Uh, there's like all kinds of fun things you can uh, do with that as you have this world. And then like, you know, there's like a ground plane uh, of particles and a wall of particles all built in form. Uh, but then we have like sparkles in particular. And you, know, you could emit from parent particles from form in particular. There's just all kinds of things you can do when using these incredible tools together, which they are now like built in, which is fantastic. Okay, here we go. Got a couple more here. This is uh, number eight, I think. What is this? Number eight. Yes, using layer maps. Layer maps. People who are familiar with form uh, know about layer maps, but they've been recently added to particular. So a lot of people who are uh, have a background in particular maybe don't know what layer maps are. So that's my hidden gem: is using layer maps. Now, what layer maps allow us to do is to use another layer as a map for our particles for all kinds of stuff. So to show you what I have going on here first, I have this texture. It's just like this uh, nebula texture. And I want you to notice too that there are dark parts in this uh, part of the image and bright spots in this part of the image. And that's important because some of the uh, ways you can map layer stuff onto particles will use that luminance. So I have here, um, Actually, if I zoom in close, you can kind of see this is actually a very dense grid of particles. Very dense grid of form, form particles. But what I can do is go into layer maps, and these are the different ways that I can map another layer to control my particles. So if you had, let's say, a corporate logo or something, you could use it to control the rotation of particles or use it to, use it to control the size of particles or the displacement or the turbulence strength or whatever. You could do all kinds of really fun and interesting things by using other layers to control your particles. So I'll just start off really simple here. I'll go to color and alpha, and I need to specify that I want to use this uh, layer as my 
uh, color. It's always a good idea to uh, use effects and masks if you're using effects and masks. And oftentimes it doesn't work because you need to specify the map over value. So you can't just say like, hey, use this layer. You have to say, use this layer in this way. So by default, map over is off, but I can map this layer over X and Y. I can map it over X and Z, or I can map it over time. I could do all the kinds of interesting things in that way, but I'll just keep it simple, map it over um, X and Y. Now, uh, it doesn't seem like anything happened, but what it's done is it's mapped all of the color data from that nebula onto my particles. So now my particles can be displaced, they can move, and it's going to have the color of that image. So there's all kinds of fun things we could do with that. So let's say I want to displace this. So I'll say I want RGB to XYZ, and again, we have to do, uh, we have to set the map up, pre-comp space texture, and then we have to choose how we're going to map this. Let's map it over X and Y. So now we've displaced our particles. I can control the strength here, which is pretty exciting. So again, it's using the lum luminance. So it's pushing back the black particles and pulling forward the uh, brighter particles and uh, using that to displace this. So I could go into my rotation here so we could kind of see this a little bit more. And we're creating, oh, it went the other way. I always get confused with like white and black, which, which way, which direction, which thing goes. So it's actually pushing back the white particles and pulling forward the black particles. I don't know, whatever, I always get confused. So anyways, we can see that we're actually almost creating 3D geometry out of particles by using a layer map and displacing uh, the stuff this way. So I could go to my displacement. Maybe I even increase the... Don't be an alarm right now. That's not a great time for an alarm. Uh, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, so I can increase strength, and then you can see that I'm actually displacing the particles and, uh, again, creating almost like a 3D geometry with this. So layer maps are a very powerful way of uh, creating great imagery. And again, back to uh, the particularly starry night, uh, when I first um, applied this, you know, I got all of this, um, this beautiful randomness, kind of like similar to what Van Gogh had, where like they're just, you know, here's like a little piece of white for some reason. There's like a yellowish little piece of paint in there. And I wanted to be able to capture all of that in my paint strokes, so I use layer maps. I just brought this in as like a simple like image, and that's how I was able to create the layer map in the background. Then I could displace it and move those particles around with other tools, but they already had Van Gogh's color palette and his uh, paint choices because of layer maps. Okay, we are now at number nine. Number nine of the hidden gems. Number nine is making magic in 3D. Making magic in 3D. So basically, this is letting you know that we can use 3D objects, in particular, in two ways. And uh, pause for a dramatic effect while I drink water. But we can use 3D objects in two different ways in particular. We can use it in a form way, and we can use it in a particular way. So when we use it with particular, a 3D object becomes an emitter. So we can emit things from a 3D object. And sometimes that's more challenging because, you know, if you have a face and it's emitting particles, or a head that's emitting particles, it's going to look similar to if you had a sphere emitting particles. So it's not going to be until the, the final tip that that becomes cool. So we'll save that for a, a second. But when you have form particles, what it does is it arranges those particles in the shape of a 3D object. So I'll go into emitter, and uh, I'll change this to box, change this to uh, classic form. We have a box of particles here. But what I want to do is actually not do uh, a box. I want to change this to 3D model. I want to emit from a 3D model. Now, it goes black initially because it's like, OK, well, what 3D model do you want to emit from? And you haven't chosen one yet. So that's why you don't panic. That's, it's normal. And so I can click on choose model. And there's a load of 3D models that ship with particular. So I have a huge collection here. I mentioned the, uh, the bust of a male. So let's say male bust here. So now um, I don't have enough uh, particles. I need more particles. So what I could do is increase my particles. And then now we have a face, a head, a bust, 
being made out of particles, which is pretty cool. And because it's being arranged in 3D, I can, you know, move this around like so. And again, because it's uh, particular, works with lights, I can uh, light this up. Well, it's not showing first. I need to go to my uh, light settings here. So I can go into lighting and enable lighting. And then, okay, now it's too dark. Okay, I'm going to bump up the intensity here. There we go. So you see we have, uh, again, 3D particles that we can light and work with in a really cool way. And of course, we have all the benefits of uh, trap code form in this case. I'm just going to up the particle count so we have a little bit more coverage here. But I can go into my displace section. I could go into turbulence field, and I could increase the uh, displacement, create some interesting effects there. I could have that same thing affect the size. Ooh, that's really gross. Apologies. Uh, I could have it affect the opacity. There we go. And so now, like, it's already starting to have a little bit of life. You know, we could add more particles if we want to, but now we have a 3D head that we could move a camera around, we could move lights around, we could set up, like, um, other lights and uh, light this in a normal way, but um, all because of the power of, uh, of form and 3D objects, which is pretty cool. I uh, really love that ability. Okay. Um, so I mentioned how it's more challenging using them with particular without the final tip. So let's get to the final tip, which is... Da, 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 da. Try to make it seem more grandiose than it is. Is velocity over life. Velocity over life. So in the same way that we can control most properties in, uh, or many properties in particular, with a graph, there's, you know, the size over life, opacity over life, and we could use this really great newly redesigned graph to control these different attributes. Velocity over life is one that doesn't get enough love. So if I go to um, the same spot, emitter, I'm going to choose 3D model, and uh, let's just go ahead and choose the same 3D model. I'll just... I'll bust female, kind of spread the wealth here. And if I choose uh, this now, it's, it's by default, it's doing this um, particular behavior. So again, we can't really tell that we have a 3D head here. But if I wanted to have the particles here on the head and then have some particles kind of like flying off, particular would be the best choice or over form. So I could get the best of both worlds here by going into velocity over life. So what I could do is have the velocity be nothing in the beginning and nothing for a while. There we go, there we go. And maybe crank up the particles per second. So there's more particles here. And then what happens is over life, then they start to drift. See that? So then we get the best of both worlds. We have some particles that when they're born, the first half of their life, they just like hang out. They're like, that's cool, I'm chilling. And then they start getting a little antsy. They start having a midlife crisis, start buying a motorcycle and wanting to go uh, travel the world. And then they want to go off and do things, right? So the power and the control of using form in particular together, using velocity over life. And there you have it. Uh, let's see. Okay, I think that's, um, that's about my, my time. Thank you so much. It means a lot that you would sit here at the very end when the energy, everybody's like packing up and going away and stuff like that. So thank you so much for uh, being here. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.